That was just to wake us up in case somebody had dozed off. Well, praise the Lord. Our scripture was read, and it is Galatians 3.28. First of all, I'd just like to say that uh, this has got to be one of about five <coughs> messages because I tried to fit it in and there was way too much for one message. So maybe one day I'll arrive at completing the task that I was hoping to start when I started. If any of you don't know what it's like to not have to be your own editor, boy, you've got to edit, don't you? <laughs> got to edit. The scriptures are so rich. Amen. I'm so thankful that God has uh, granted us in that last passage. I don't know if I can go back to it. Yep. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And because of this precious truth, that's why we can be thankful that uh, we have complete redemption. Amen. We have full salvation. And we have equality with all of the Christians. That's at least one thing. That three things we can get out of that passage and we can study that longer. Because we are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. I'm also thankful that God has uh, granted to all the human race an equal employment opportunity. <laughs> as described in Matthew uh, 28, verse 19 and 20. Have you ever thought of that as uh, God's uh, want ad in the, in the paper? And um, that we're supposed to go make disciples, baptizing them, teaching them. And he's promised to be with us to the end of the age. I'm also thankful that Christ, uh, God has made me a new creature in Christ. In 2 Corinthians first, uh, chapter 5 and verse 17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? New, new creature. creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. However, when I woke up this morning, and yesterday morning, and the morning before that, I found myself to number one, being a woman by birth, and two, being a wife by choice, and also by my husband putting up with me, and three, becoming a mother about 35 years ago. This is the, the condition, the human condition that I face every day, and some of you can uh, uh, commiserate with that, but this is who, this is the way things are. So scriptures have that have kind of directed, um, directed my uh, walk as a Christian woman, and before I share some of those scriptures and insights, insights I think I'll, we would just like to bow our heads in prayer and uh, ask God to call me and give us the message. Heavenly Father, it is with fear and trembling that I share your precious word today. And please guide and direct us to rightfully divide it so that our hearts will be refreshed with a new glimpse of your everlasting love for us. And may we love you more today than we did yesterday. In the holy name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. In 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18, it says, But we... With open face beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So we are being changed into the same image, the glory of the Lord, into the same image of the glory of the Lord, from glory to glory. And who's doing it? The Spirit of the Lord. So one of the questions that I was wanting to think about is, um, who is God, what's he like, and um, how does his word show me his character in both male and female? And uh, over the years I've thought about that and studied that, as you probably have accidentally. Genesis 127 says, so God created man in his own image, and in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. In my understanding of Genesis 1.27, I see God as expressing his very nature in two very different yet complementary beings, each with distinct assets and aspects of their nature. And those assets and aspects are both 
psychological and biological. In fact, I believe that we shall discover that God engineered the biology of man and woman to produce distinct thought processes and methods of accomplishing things. In so doing, God shows his diversity in both in diversity and unity, for both are created in the image of God. So I'm going to use a con concept of a continuum. And um, as it says, a continuous sequence in which adjacent elements are not perceptibly different from each other, although the extremes are quite distinct at the fast end of the fast, slow continuum. So if you think about a continuum, so I'm going to talk about this. Oops, I went wrong. If you think about, um, think of the qualities of being masculine at one end and the qualities of being feminine at the other end. And the gradual merging and sharing of these qualities exist in the middle of the continuum. So some men perceive themselves as more or less masculine than other men. And some women see themselves as more or less feminine than other women. So that you start talking about, well, a man's like this, and there will be a woman who will say, well, that sort of describes me. And you describe a woman, and men will say, well, I have some of those tender feelings too. And what's the point? What's the point of this? So in God's sight and in his foresight, he provided in the two sexes, of the species, a more complete view or understanding of the nature of God, who is love. So that man plus woman equals mankind, and mankind is created in the image of God. <laughs> so we want to see what God is like, we have to look at the whole picture of who God has created. So we could say that God must have both male and female personality traits. So shouldn't we investigate the qualities God has demonstrated to us in his distinctly separate but inseparable creation? So in Ephesians, because in Ephesians 5.21 it reads, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. So now we have male and female, and God's calling them one flesh. So now at some point, these two separate beings become no longer separate, but one, still maintaining their distinct individuality and overlapping of the male to female continuum that means the whole is greater than its parts and now reflects the image of God even more clearly. That second image, obviously, would be more like the Ephesians part where um, they are no longer two, but they are one. Well, we know that um, certainly the DNA of a beautiful child shows where two previously genetically unrelated people, isn't that funny, two people that aren't related to each other, get married, and now they share their DNA in another distinct yet joined human being, and dad and mom are related because they have little Priscilla or a little Aquila between them. So you, you aren't related when you get married, but after you have a child, now you're related. And that's what it's talking about, at least at that one part about one flesh. However, um, even when children are not present, as in the case of, for instance, Samuel's uh, mother, uh, the overlapping love of male and female were expressed. And then, remember when El Elkanah said to her husband, her husband, yeah, Elkanah, her husband said to uh, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? So even in the absence of children, God has made a possibility for a husband and a wife to be so uniquely joined together that um, they, are, uh, they are reflecting the character of God. Um, uh, I'm going to say there are many here today that are um, either are not married or you were married but are widowed or divorced, and there will always be some who choose not to marry, or for whom nature or whatever reason makes marriage not a choice. But whether we knew them or not, we all have been given the DNA of our parents, 
And through the grace of God, we could all have, we were given a heavenly father who is perfect. Whether we had a perfect earthly father or not, we have a perfect heavenly father that everyone here can partake of that love and that knowing that father. And we have the scriptures refer to Jesus as our elder brother because he's gone through everything we've gone through. And so uh, he's, he's our elder brother, Jesus Christ our Lord. So you all have family here, and hopefully this church family is your best family. I know I'm closer to my brothers and sisters in the Lord than I am to even some of my own flesh and blood. Amen? Amen. And work for you too? Well, um, so please understand that this study is not trying to make single people feel uncomfortable, and uh, we're just wanting to deal with God's ideal in the scriptures, okay? So, are you all good? I'm not trying to pick on anybody. Um, speaking of divorce, however, um, two Old Testament passages show God's concern for the status of divorced women. And quickly, I just want to go over a couple of these that point out the protective position that God has given to women in his uh, scriptures. And one is that um, this bill of divorcement must be written and not oral. And as you can think about that, what would be some of the advantages of having to make that an oral? Uh, I mean, if it was oral, you get uh, the husband could get a little drunk. We were speaking about drinking this morning, and um, you know he could be upset. You didn't salt the potatoes. The manioc is not cooked right. You know, and um, I I'm upset with you, and so poof, get out of here. I'm divorcing you. And the next morning he wakes up, and his bed's not made. He went, I wonder what happened last night. <laughs> On the other hand, in the Hebrew. Uh, pattern, a woman had to be protected because he had to be at least sober enough to be able to write and give her a bill of, of divorcement. And so God was protecting the family and protecting the woman from some foolish act that her husband might be able to commit against her, a quick termination of the marriage contract. So there's another passage that I thought was interesting, Exodus 21 verse 10, and if you think about this, this is like Leah's case. Um, when her, husband, her dad tricked uh, Jacob into having two wives, when he really only wanted who? Rachel. And, but he got Leah first, and in the scriptures it says, If he take him another wife, her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage shall he not diminish. And this should be a deterrent to what? Um, polygamy, I would say, since the man would have to make provisions for his new wife as well as, the, as his original wife or wives. And the women were not to be discarded without care. In this, I see the principle for alimony, don't you? Yeah. That uh, he has to provide a, a, a legal domain. And the, the most interesting part is he can't even say, I'm not going to be your husband anymore. He has to continue to be your husband. Very interesting provision for a woman. In Deuteronomy 24, verse 5, unlike my grandmother, whose fiancé actually was killed in World War I and never came back to marry her, and she grieved that and let all of her children know about that, even after she married my grandfather, uh, God had a provision for newlyweds that if, the, if he was supposed to go out to war, um, he's not supposed to, he's, he shall be free at home one year and shall cheer up his wife, which he hath taken. So isn't that an interesting thing that God would think about? Even uh, a woman, you know, just getting married, poof, you lose your husband in the war. No, stay home for a year. God provided that because he loved the man and he loves the woman. And how kind and thoughtful that precious idea is. Now in Genesis, back to understanding of how God makes two into one after the fall. Notice in, in Genesis, the woman is stricken in her emotions with, um, for one thing, freedom of choice and freedom of being hit the hardest, uh, freedom of will. He puts enmity or hatred between me and the woman, that's a pretty strong emotion, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head and it shall bruise his heel. We could do a whole study on this, how this is the first time that God actually gives the gift of understanding the difference between good and evil, and in that he gives righteousness. We brought that up in Sabbath school lesson not too long ago. But unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow, strong emotion, and thy conception, 
And in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Ruling over you. Hmm. Oh, in our independence, who of us wants anyone to rule over them? Just raise your hand, wave a bit right now, right now. <laughs> there is somebody that wants somebody to rule over them. There is a belief in having, uh, being the one who says, well, my husband sent me. I love that. I love to say, I love to say, my husband said, <laughs> and then they take care of I like that part. Uh, but this part about being ruled over, you know, it's like freedom of choice, freedom of, of your will. It's being hit very, very hard on the woman. And so, um, I want to ask this question. In Genesis 3, verse 15 through 16, notice um, if God really loves us, and he really loves you, I'm speaking to the men now, as a man, and he put this thing by the sweat of thy face, and if you've ever seen our pastor out doing his <laughs> other job, <laughs> Which he's a landscaper. Yes. Florida, you're going to have some sweat if you're outside, mm -hmm. right? But by the sweat of thy face, why did he put that as part of the curse? And I put that in parentheses or in quotation marks after the disobedience in the garden. And we have a beautiful quote from a book that Ellen T. White wrote, Patriarchs and Prophets, part of that five part conflict series that says this wonderful thing. And when, as a result of his disobedience, he, Adam, was driven from his beautiful home and forced to struggle with a stubborn soil to gain his daily bread, that very labor, although widely different from his pleasant occupation in the garden, was a safeguard against temptation and a source of what? Happiness. Happiness. Those who regard work as a curse. curse, attended though it be with weariness and pain, are cherishing a what? An error. An error. So God gave this sweat of the brow to Adam as a blessing to guard him, safeguard against temptation and the source of happiness. You, you, that feeling you have when you've completed something. Mm -hmm. And if he had been floating around with everything being so easy, you know, I don't hands on the devil's workshop, yes. right? So, if God really loves us, and he really loves me, and you as women, and the, the part about, and he shall rule over you, why did he put this as part of a curse? The same question after the disobedience in the garden. We just found out that it was actually a blessing for Adam. So let's see about for the woman. In the creation, God made her the equal of Adam. Had they remained obedient to God in harmony with his great law of love, they would ever have been in harmony with each other. Very you go. In harmony with each other, if you're in harmony with each other, you're both talking, you're weighing things out together, it's, you're making beautiful music, and you're in harmony with each other, right? But sin had brought discord, and now their union could be maintained and harmony preserved only by submission on the part of the one or the other. Eve had been the first in transgression, and she had fallen into temptation by separating from her companion, contrary to the divine direction, and it was by her solicitation that Adam sinned, and she was now placed in subjection to her husband. Where, where was that divine direction? Cleave to your wife. That's like glue when things are stuck together. Stick by your wife and stick by your husband. Cleave to one another. So that was the direction that God gave. And that's how we know that when you stick by that there was protection in that. Well, had the principles, did I go backwards? Oh no, had the principles joined in the law of God been cherished by the fallen race, this sentence, though growing out of the result of sin, would have proved a blessing to them. What, what that, that, that she would be in submission to her husband. That would be prove a blessing to them, even though it came because of the fall. But man's abuse of the supremacy that thus given him has too often rendered the lot of women very bitter and made her life a burden. Hey, most of the time, we marry somebody that is equal to our size or a little bit bigger than we are. And there is some physical strengths that men have that women don't have. 
Hence, honey, will you open this pickle jar? Right? <laughs> Nobody's ever asked somebody else to open a jar. Yes, you asked for that, right? Say amen. 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 All right. I know you're awake. Okay. But the force and, force and the strength that a man might have is something that uh, has been used against women. And instead of it being a real blessing like it was supposed to be, it wasn't exactly that blessing. So now then, let's turn to some brain research for a moment, shall we? And look to find some interesting insights into what reasons, if any, God would place Eve under Adam's responsibility forever after. And has God really given to woman a protected place? That's what I want to know. So here we go. Um, this thing about male and female brains is very interesting, and I figured we ought to have some science for it instead of me just saying what the conclusion is. I thought you might want to, you know, read and see what's actually up there too. So let's let's read this thing. Brain scientists have discovered that a person's tendency to compartmentalize stems largely from fewer connections within their corpus callosum, superhighway, as well as its unique makeup. So you all know what that was, right? That Latin word? Yeah, it's a superhighway. According to researcher Rita Carter and neuropsychologist Christopher Frith, in mapping the mind, the corpus callosum is 25% smaller in men than in women. Now that might sound like something bad, but it's really something good. Further, a team of Israeli fetal researchers found that, in the, that the in utero influence of testosterone decreases the growth of nerve connections between the hemispheres. We know there's two hemispheres in the brain, left and right, making mental multitasking much more difficult. But what men gain from their brain structure is, one, a superior ability to compartmentalize, and two, deeply process various functions and thoughts without being distracted, because they don't have as many of these connections going across the brain from one side to the other. They can deeply process one thing at a time, and without being distracted. Very difficult for most of for what we'll see. Let's read some more. A 1999 Journal of Neuroscience study demonstrated that the influence of estrogen gives women far more of that connectivity, more of these nerves going from one hemisphere to the other, and thus a superior ability and predisposition toward thinking about and doing many things at once. Does that describe? Yeah, absolutely. That describes. <laughs> And uh, Shanti Feldhand has said, I have compared a woman's thought life to a personal computer with multiple windows open at one time. Okay? Multiple windows open at one time. I see some smile. Most women know what it's like to be aware of, thinking about, or actually doing many things at once and can transition seamlessly back and forth between personal and work tasks. And in her, um, in her, uh, other book she talks about when a man goes to work, personal is left at the door, he walks through the door, now he's at work. And what he does at work is work, and what he does at home is home, and there the twain shall meet. <laughs> so when a woman comes to work and she starts talking about her personal life, men are going, no, this is workplace. We don't talk about personal life here. But women talk about just bring it with them for both places. And it can be detrimental, as we will see. The downside to being able to manage all those open windows for a woman, however, is most women, 81%, according to my survey, have a hard time closing out thoughts that are nagging them. So this is why, and I've had this discussion with several women in the church already, when you hit the pillow, you are going through the house, checking all the doors, making sure all the things that you have to do for tomorrow, and you're closing your windows, but your husband hits the pillow, and like, <laughs> <laughs> and you're going, how did this happen, you know? <laughs> how does he do this? He just closes the window. <laughs> Most men, by contrast, find all those multiple windows exhausting just to think about. A man's thought life is more like a computer with one window open at a time. He works on it, closes it out, and then opens another. And he usually has no trouble 
closing out thoughts that are uh, bothering you. Now, hence, the tendency for a man to tell his wife, just don't think about it. <laughs> Advice that may seem easy to him, but feels impossible for her. And in other words, he's far more predisposed to uh, compartmentalize, and he's better at it. I, and this is something that Shanti Feldham is, is sharing from her point of view. She's the I. And I was talking to a friend of mine um, who has a position in the conference, and she's a woman. And uh, we, we both just laughed because she had shared with me an incident, and I said, I had totally forgotten about your incident until I was reading this to, to her the other day on the phone. I would guess that almost every woman has been in the mortifying situation of becoming emotional in a professional setting, and wishing she could turn back time and do it differently, or vanish into the floorboards. In one interview, I was speaking with the vice president of a large technology company, and when I asked him what might women unintentionally do that hurts their effectiveness with men, and he laughed, and in one smooth move, rolled his chair to the corner of his L-shaped desk, picked up a large box of Kleenex, rolled his chair back, and plunked the box down in front of me. Do you see this box of Kleenex, he asked, raising his eyebrows, if I only work with men. There would be no That's right. <laughs> A male friend of mine gave me some context for this discussion, and he told me, now this is what he told Shanti. Men have spent a lifetime mastering their own emotions, seeing them as inconvenient and counterproductive. We often see them as, we often even see them, meaning their emotions, as capitulating to a side of ourselves that gets in the way of a logical side. Capitulating, surrendering. Okay, I've cried, I'm emotional. But most of the time, men are spending their time trying to master their emotions. How different than us women, huh? Mm -hmm. So, what is this all about? Well, let's review the first, um, let me see. Do one more. Just so you know who was doing this. She's written this wonderful book. She was a researcher and Harvard trained in, uh, in research and did thousands of uh, personal surveys where providing the men with an anonymity, she found out some of the things that they really were thinking in the workplace. So can we conclude that there is a biological basis for a difference in the way the female and male brain process life? Can you give me a yes or no answer on that? That on this continuum of variations with the ends being at extreme opposites, there is a continuum of logical to emotional processing associated with uh, male and female? You think so? Okay, let's, let's take that as a, a, a premise. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 11, 1 through 12. We're not going to go through all the way to 12, but this is where it's found. And be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. And I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things. And keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. And here's something he wants us to know. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Amen. That's just scripture, isn't it? So if you permit me to equate the head brain with the male factor and the head heart emotions with the female factor, I think we can all agree that we would not want to be without either organ or what we are asking them to represent here. And you think about the brain, it's complex, it's innovative, the heart is fearless and intuitive. However, it's a never-ending fight between your brain and your heart. And, um, in the Christian life, the decisions we must make with the print, uh, must begin with the principles of the logos, the word, the thoughts of God written in our hearts. Remember, God said that I will take your heart, I will take out your stony heart, and I will write in your fleshy heart, I'll write my law in your heart. And God's law is, first of all, how to love God, and second of all, how to love people. So it's a law of love that is written in our heart. And we are to be governed by that law, which is the logos, the word, the written word. 
So the mom.